Section 3.2, the product and quotient rules. This is objective one, where we're going to compute derivatives using the product rule. By the time we're done, you should know how to write the two things you can do with an expression that will alter the way an expression looks without changing its value. Before we get into this product rule or the quotient rule, we want to connect to our old knowledge. We want to think about what we would do if we have two differentiable functions and the things that we can do with those functions prior to taking derivatives. The question for today is, what is the derivative of f times g? Now our gut instinct and what we would hope would happen is that taking the derivative of the product would be the same as the product of the derivatives. Unfortunately, our gut instinct in this case will be wrong, and as a result, a lot of the free response and multiple choice questions that deal with this particular rule will have distractors that deal with applying this when this is incorrect, because that's what you want to do even though it's wrong. So to prove why it's wrong, let's look at a very simple example where f of x equals 3x plus 2 and g of x equals x squared. If I take the derivative of f, I will get a 3, and if I take the derivative of g of x, I will get a 2x. Multiplying those together gives me a 6x. However, if I actually multiply those two fractions together, those two functions together and distribute, I'll have a 3x squared times an x, excuse me, I will have a 3x plus 2 times an x squared, where if I distribute, I'll get a 3x cubed plus a 2x squared, and if I take the derivative of this, I end up with a 9x squared plus a 4x. That is not the same as 6x. So what is going on here? Why does this not work and how do I get the actual derivative when I need it? To find out what that answer is, you have to backtrack to the definition of the derivative. So if we look at the definition of the derivative, we have the derivative with respect to x of f of x plus g of x will equal that limit as h approaches 0 of, notice we plugged in that x plus h, and then we're going to subtract what comes out when we plug in x. Now this right now does not look very user friendly, so we're going to use an algebraic technique that will enable us to create things that look good. We can kind of see that we've got this f of x plus h, and we've got an f of x that's being subtracted, so that kind of looks something like the derivative of f, and we see this g of x plus h minus a g of x that kind of looks like the derivative of g, but because they're attached to these two things that are multiplied, we can't just factor out and get both of those derivatives. So instead, we're going to introduce a new term, actually two new terms, whose sum is 0, because one of the ways that we can alter the way an expression looks without changing its value is to either multiply by 1 or we can add something that equals 0. So that's what we're going to do in this next step. We have chosen to subtract an f of x times a g of x plus h, and then add the same thing back on. When we do that, we have created something that equals 0. Now that we've done that, we can see that we have some terms here that have similar factors, and so we can group things together. And if we look at the next step, you can see that out of these two that were here, I factored out the g of x plus h, and the leftovers were then f of x plus h minus an f of x. So there's that numerator for the derivative of f that we were hoping to have. If we group these two together, we can see that there's an f of x in common. So if I pull the f of x out, then I'm left with the g of x plus h minus the g of x. So again, there's that derivative of g that's coming out of the wash. So now we're going to apply properties of limits and split these so that we can actually see those derivatives more clearly. If I do that, I can distribute this limit to a g of x plus h times this limit, then add the limit of f of x times this limit. When we do that, we can see that we've now created this derivative of g, and we've created this derivative of f, so we can replace those with the derivative notation. The last thing that we need to do is let h go to 0. Since this has no h's in it, it's not going to change, whereas this one, as h goes to 0, will turn into g of x. So we end up getting 
that g times the derivative of f plus f times the derivative of g. So that is now our product rule. If we have two functions multiplied together, we can take the derivative of them by doing the first function times the derivative of the second plus the second one times the derivative of the first. What I'd like you to do now is write in words how you're going to take the derivative of a product and write it here so that you have it to go back and look at when you forget. Let's do some examples now so that we can see this product rule in action. On the first example, part a, we want to find the derivative of x cubed times e to the x. So we can see that we have an f and we have a g. So the derivative will be the first one times the derivative of the second plus the second one times the derivative of the first. So I'm going to put my first function here times the derivative of the second. Remember that the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x plus the second one times the derivative of the first. Now if this were a free response we could leave it just like this and not have any problems at all. However, sometimes you need to be able to work with this algebraically and get answers like e to the x factored out with an x cubed plus a 3x squared or you could even factor out an x squared in addition to that e to the x and you would get an x plus a 3. So all three of these would be fair game for a multiple choice problem. If we look at the next one, before I take the derivative, I'm going to rewrite each factor in a way that makes it easy to apply derivative rules. So again, I have a first one and a second one, and I will take the derivative by doing the first times the derivative of the second plus the second one times the derivative of the first one. So the first one unchanged is x to the one half. Derivative of the second is e to the x. The second one is e to the x and the derivative of the second one or the first one is one half x to the negative one half. So again you could leave it like this if it were free response. If it's not free response they would probably factor the e to the x and rewrite the rational exponents as radicals. So I'd get a root x plus a 1 over a 2 root x. Last one. This one illustrates how anytime you're taking a derivative you have a choice. You can either take the derivative and then simplify the result when you're done or you can simplify first and then take the derivative. And my experience has shown that simplifying first is 99.99% of the time the more beneficial route to take. It's more efficient, you make fewer mistakes, and it's simpler. So what we're going to do first before we take the derivative is we are going to distribute and combine our like terms. If I multiply a 1 over y squared times this, I will reduce my y's to a y squared times e to the y. If I do a 1 over y squared times this one, I will get a 5y cubed times e to the y. And if I multiply a negative 3 over y to the fourth, I'll end up with a negative 3 e to the y. And this times this last term here will give me a negative 15y times e to the y. So if I look now, I've distributed through so I don't have two big parentheses. I can also notice that I'm going to have to do the product rule here and here and on this final term. So it might actually be simpler for me if I factor that e to the y out because that's what's forcing me to do the product rule and then I'm left with a y squared plus a 5y cubed minus a 3 minus a 15y. By doing this I have created a first function and a second function both of which can be easily derived. So now I'm ready to apply that product rule. I'll have the first term times the derivative of the second plus the second one times the derivative of the first. 
Again, I can pull those e to the y's out to make it look like a multiple choice answer option. And I'm going to have this plus this one. So I'm going to combine my like terms and put them in descending order. So I'll have a 5y cubed. I've got 15y squared plus another y squared gives me 16y squared. I've got a 2y minus a 15y. And I have a negative 15 minus a 3. And now I'm done. With example 2, we want to find the equation of the tangent line to this function at the point 0, 0. So again, we're finding equations of lines which will involve a point and a slope. So the point is the given point. The slope will be the derivative evaluated at that point. So in order to get the derivative evaluated at the point, I'm going to have to do the product rule, which is why it's in this section. I have the first one times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. And I need to evaluate that slope when x is 0, because I'm interested in the tangent slope that goes with this point. So if I plug in 0, I end up with this disappearing, and I get e to the 0 times a 2 is just a 2. Now that I've got the point and I've got the slope, I can write the equation of the line, which will be y equals 2 times x minus 0 plus 0, or you could just write y equals 2x. With example 3, this one's a little more challenging. We now have three differentiable functions, and we want to find the derivative of all three. So we'll start off by choosing to group two of them together. So let's say this is our first one, and this is our second. Then applying the product rule, I'll get the first one times the derivative of the second plus the second one times the derivative of the first. Now the first, because it has two terms in it, is going to require that product rule again. So I would have the first one of the first times the derivative of the second plus the second one times the derivative of the first. Now if we back up and look at what's going on here, I had three functions, and I end up with three terms if I distribute that h. I'll have an f times a g times an h prime, plus an f times an h times a g prime, plus an h times a g times an f prime. If we look, three terms, or three factors, gave us three terms when we took the derivative, and when we took the derivative, we left 2 alone and then multiplied by the derivative of the second, or the third, or the first. So each one of those functions gets to have a derivative, and it's coupled with the two other ones that don't have the derivatives. So hopefully this pattern you could apply if I had four functions multiplied together. If I had four functions multiplied, I'd get four terms, and you'd have three of those functions left alone, and then the other one as the derivative, and you would just do every combination. With our example 4, we're looking at it graphically. Here, f is our red function, and g is our blue function, and we're interested in creating a new function called u that is the product of those two. So we are wanting to find u prime of 1. So to get there, let's find u prime of x first. Because we have two things multiplied together, we will have the first function times the derivative of the second, plus the second times the derivative of the first. And because I want u prime of 1, that means I'm going to replace all of these x's with 1's. When I do that, I can now interpret each of these factors graphically. f of 1 means the output on the function that goes with 1, or the y-coordinate that goes with 1. So if I go to 1 and then up to the y-coordinate, we can see that f of 1 is 2. g prime of 1, 
that's the derivative or a synonym for the slope. We're going to go look at the slope of the blue curve at 1. And since we're on a line, we can see the slope of that line is down 1 over 1, down 1 over 1. So g prime is a negative 1. If we look at g now at 1, we want the y coordinate for g at 1. And that one is 1. And then we want the slope of the red one at 1. So this slope is going to be up 2 over 1. Multiply those together and add. We end up with u prime of 1 equaling 0. With example 5, we have f of 3 is 4, g of 3 is 2, and then the tangent slope of f at 3 is negative 6, and the tangent slope of g at 3 is 5. We're interested in the derivative of the product evaluated at 3. So the derivative of the product would be the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. Now I gave myself a little bit of space because I'm interested in evaluating this at 3. So I'm going to plug 3's in for each of these and then I'm going to go look at my list and see what each of those equals. f of 3 is a 4, g prime of 3 is a 5, g of 3 is 2, and f prime of 3 is negative 6. Put those together I get a 20 minus a 12. I end up with and 8. With example 6, we have a manufacturer producing bolts of fabric with a fixed width. The quantity of fabric that is sold at the selling is a function of the selling price. So we can write the quantity is a function of the selling price. So then the revenue is going to be how much we sold times the price that we charged. So the revenue that is based on that price will be the price we charged times how much we sold or the quantity. We're interested in knowing what the revenue's derivative is at 20. Before we compute the revenue's derivative at 20 though, I would like to think about what that's going to represent graphically. So let's say that this is our revenue curve and we have a 20, which is the price per yard that we're charging. The revenue has an input that is price and the output is the money that comes into the store when we sell our yards of fabric. So here's our price of $20 per yard and we're going to come up here and we're going to compute the slope here. So we're measuring the price in dollars per yard and we're going to get money coming out. So rise over run, which is what we're looking for, is going to be an increase in revenue for an increase in price. So we're going to do our prime of P and again we're going to use our product rule which will be our first one times the derivative of our second plus our second times the derivative of our first. And the derivative of the first might throw a few of you off. You might think that's a constant and you want to just put a zero. But keep in mind that we are differentiating with respect to p. So it's like having an x here and differentiating it with respect to x. We're still going to get a 1 because we'll apply that power rule to the variable p. If I now compute our prime of 20, that means I need to replace all of my p's with 20. So this would be a 20. f prime of 20, there's a typo here, make that a 20 in your notes, should be a negative 350. And then we're going to add f of 20 times 1, which is 10,000. Add those together, we end up with 3,000. Now because we're interested in the units for this, it's going to be dollars of revenue per every dollar increase in the price that's measured in dollars per yard. Now I'd like you to do the notes web exam problems and then write the two things you can do with an expression that will alter the way the expression looks without changing its value.